welcome everybody. We really appreciate this um, large group of people all getting together. Uh, we we realize um, that communication is absolutely essential in moving forward. Uh, our project uh, was finally funded from a 2011 proposal so, um, in March of 2013, and we, at that time, kind of had to sit back. We stood back and reevaluated what we had proposed relative to lots of other developments going on, including funded projects that each of us had and the Earth Cube landscape. And we spent a lot of time building some of the software foundations and conceptual foundations for a really excellent integrated data system for CZOs and, and beyond. Um, but we realized really clearly that our, the webinars that we've been giving to data managers and, um, and also the data manager meetings, these IMC meetings, weren't really re reaching a broad enough audience. Um, and that it's really important to have the investigators from each CZO the, the, the data managers and field staff from that CZO, along with grad students and others, meet up with the entire CZO data team because we're all quite diverse and we all have different roles in, in this project. And so I think moving forward, um, uh, understanding what each of our roles are in the management uh, or in the sharing primarily of Calhoun data um, will really serve us all well. So with that introduction, I'd like to to basically go down this list. If you can all share my screen, I'll highlight individuals and you can introduce yourself uh, so we can learn your voice and your role in um, managing and sharing Calhoun data. So we'll start with Dan. Okay, Dan Richter. I'm in Duke with uh, six or seven people who will introduce themselves, I guess, but uh, Emil Carre, John Mallard, Zach Breckheisen, Paul Heine, and Will Cook, and myself. All right. Uh, well, Dan, I, why don't you I, go I, around the room and, um, and have people introduce themselves, uh, yeah. since I and can't I've, see that list. Okay, so can you hear me, Anthony? Really well. Okay, so I would like to start the meeting by crediting Will Cook with holding things together. I've been out of town for a couple of weeks, and and so we'll get a good uh, first step out of this meeting. So Will, go first. All right, I'm Will Cook. I'm the data manager. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, uh, brevity is good. Uh, Paul Heine, uh, data generator. <laughs> uh, John Mallard, PhD student. Um, we'll say hydrologic data generator. I'm Ilker Corporato, Ecohydrology, and one of the PIs of the Carbon CTO. Uh, and modeler. Uh, Zachary Breckheisen, uh, PhD student with Dan Richter, uh, soil, gas, biogeochemistry, and GIS data generator, I guess. So that's all of us here at Duke. All right. So I'm going to go down this list then after that. You could see a bunch of us collaboratively typing in notes. Um, so not all, some of you may not or may or may not have permissions. I gave a few extra permissions just before the meeting, so refresh your browsers if you're um, around the email I sent out earlier this morning. If not, maybe, Will, you can, you should have permissions to add new people so that your whole team actually can edit and type into this document. That would be helpful. Um, Mike Coolan. I'm going to go down this list as typed here. Yeah. Okay, Mike Coglin. Coglin, sorry. Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Yep. Oh, uh, we couldn't we figure out you, the mute button. We thought you were on mute before. You could hear us before, I guess. Uh, uh, I said a nice thing. <laughs> uh, I'm at the University of Georgia. I'm an anthropologist. Uh, I guess uh, in terms of data, I generate GIS, uh, primarily GIS data, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, Don. Yeah, so I am also uh, at the University of Georgia working on the, the human ecology and, and some of the joint modeling um, efforts for this project. So that includes a lot of the GIS data and, uh, as well as <coughs> images, uh, as well as other sort of historical data sources. 
Super. Christoph? Christoph and Sharon. Uh, Sharon is not on Sharon the Sharon is muted. I'll unmute. Oh, it, I'll yeah. unmute you, Sharon. Oh. <laughs> yeah, hello. Christoph Lehmeyer here. I'm from the University of Kansas. Hello, Dan, also. I heard you. Um, I'm working in the field of biogeochemistry, and I'm generating data as well. Sharon? Hi. So, same thing as Christoph. I'm one of the co-PIs for the Calhoun CZO. Mm -hmm. Jing Feng? That was nearly impossible to hear. You're going to have to move your mouth really close to the microphone and jack up the gain if you can. Barely. <coughs> can somebody send can somebody on uh, mail? All right, we're going to move on to Jay. Or uh, how about this, um, uh, Dan? Can you tell us Jing, Jing Fang's role? Yeah, Jing Fang's a PI. He's at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, he does a variety of things. He's got some historic hydro hydrology data that he has. He and his team have reconstituted about 15 years of strip charts through USGS uh, systems. And uh, he's all, he also does uh, flux tower work. Uh, all right. Jay. Uh, yeah, I'm from the University of Georgia uh, postdoc. Uh, we're mostly generating soil mineralogy data. Um, I guess mostly X-ray diffraction data right now, but there'll be some other stuff, I think. Yeah. Excellent. Also, Paul. Is Paul Schroeder. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. We're sitting in a <clears throat> bigger office. So yeah, I'm one of the other co-PIs. UGA also mostly focusing on soil mineralogy and uh, so any information that tells us about rates of weathering and you know, rates of soil formation. Um, I do want to introduce uh, also today, I have two undergraduates that's just joining our team here at UGA. Um, so uh, just to let you know that part of it's working and getting started. So I'm going to let those two guys introduce themselves and go from there. Uh, Good afternoon. My name is David Richards, fifth year, senior, geology major. Thank you. I'm uh, Tony Marias. I'm a third year geology major. Great. <laughs> Have we heard from John and Caitlin? Um, I'm Caitlin. I think you heard from John. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I'm Caitlin Hodges. I'm a grad student at UGA. Uh, biogeochemistry, mostly. Um, I'm generating a lot of data with electromagnetic induction. Oh. Yeah, EMI. <laughs> EMI is like that, Anthony. Ooh. Yeah, I know my acronyms. All right. Yeah. So that's great. Um, I'm going to ask one clarifying question. Paul Hein, you called yourself a data generator, but I suspect since you're listed under staff that you're more than that. Are you like a field operations sensor person? Uh, so I, uh, I guess primarily I'm a lab manager, but I do a lot of carbon nitrogen analysis, water analysis, soil analysis, and uh, whatever other analyses are lurking under the table. So all right, um, that's actually really useful to know. Okay, perfect. All right, my name is Anthony Oftenkamp. I'm an organic geochemist by background, um, trained in oceanography and interested uh, in going from the oceans up the Amazon River to small streams and eventually soil. So I uh, have an interest in data integration, and that's why when Mark Williams left the lead of this project, I was asked by NSF and Enrique Cabrera to, to take over. My role is primarily as a coordinator of um, the, this, this really excellent team um, that's the CZO data team. Because of my, my background, I've contributed quite a bit to the uh, observations data model 2.0, that, that, which is a conceptual model, which is under the hood in nearly everything that we do within the CZO data project. 
Um, we're going to clarify uh, some of the misconceptions, I hope, around ODM2. Uh, it's a, really important for us uh, as a conceptual model, um, but not required for you to actually implement as a database system. Uh, and therefore, I was involved with um, the ODM2 vocabularies and the Yoda files that are still a work in progress. Sarah. Sarah Damiano, I work under Anthony at the Stroud Water Research Center. Um, I've also worked with ODM2 with the Yoda files and vocabulary, um, and so done some data collection and management for the Christina CBO. David Lubinsky. Hi, I'm David. I'm uh, at the University of Colorado at Boulder. I'm the kind of chief builder of criticalzone.org, which we built some years ago, and then we subsequently expanded at NSF's nudging to the add the data sets section to criticalzone.org. Um, and then after that, we added the new CDOs, um, including yourselves. I'm a part-time CDO person, sometimes very little part-time, like most of the last year. Um, but right, we do have some more funding coming from the national office to support criticalzone.org outside of the data parts um, that starts next month. So you'll probably be hearing more from me in the coming year than the past year. Tom. Hi, uh, Tom Wynack, uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center at UCSD. Um, I work with David and Ilya. Uh, um, my role has been most of metadata right now in the search algorithms, but also previously with the quasi one flow water services and water ML. All right, Emilio. Oh, I muted you, Emilio. I'm sorry. There was some desk noise. Here we go. Unmuted. Well, thanks for noticing, because I could have noticed. Um, this is Emilio Mayorga from the University of Washington in rainy Seattle. Um, my role in the CCO data team is uh, focused on the data visualization portal, and uh, I've, I've also been part of the ODM2 team, and my background is in aquatic biogeochemistry of rivers, uh, but uh, the bulk of the work these days is on environmental data systems. <laughs> Super. And David Valentine. I'm Dave Valentine, San Diego Supercomputer Center, working with Ilya Zaslowski and Tom Whiteneck. I'm working on uh, the metadata structure, uh, Water OneFlow web services, implementing ODM2 as web services, and uh, uh, working on some Yoda tools. Great. Um, there are some people missing from our team. Uh, which I'll introduce by also showing you that if you go under the CZO criticalzone.org national page and look at people who are tagged with data management or cyber infrastructure, you will see a list of our team members. Um, Megan Carter and Kirsten Leonard are missing. Um, they're from, uh, Kirsten is the director of the Interdisciplinary Alliance for Earth, um, Earth Data, AIDA, or Data Applications. I've actually, Interdisciplinary Earth Data Alliance, sorry. Uh, Megan is working with her and kind of a support staff for IGSNs and other things. Jeff Horsborough uh, developed the Quasi um, ODM1 uh, information model that was used for the Quasi HIS system that exists today and has been in operation for quite a while, and he was the PI of the ODM2 grant. Um, uh, I guess the other major player on our team is Ilya Zaslavsky, um, who uh, at the San Diego Supercomputer Center uh, supervises both Tom and David Valentine for our CZO Central Catalog. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the We've had, you know, these various meetings where I get up and describe what uh, what our CZO data team is doing, and and then the data managers come and meet all of all of our our team members. But there's been a lot of confusion and and, and misunderstanding, I think, around all of the various roles. And so we're trying to clarify that both at this meeting, but also um, with places like that that tag. And then last, before we get into um, describing what the rest of the agenda is, there is, um, we ex recently expanded 
our documentation and guidelines for how to submit CZO data for data integration. We went from a one web page to a series of 10 different web pages, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later. The main point I'm going to make now is that um, underneath each of these activities, we're now clearly marking who is kind of the main contact person and who's worked the most on, on the various data systems um, uh, so that it's more clear how you might be able to get help. We've also developed um, a CZO data help uh, line, basically an email that broadcasts to all of us um, and archives those emails so that they can be used um, uh, as to answer other people. So we're, we're building kind of uh, with what we have uh, a, some support um, capabilities. So we hope um, that will help you out. So the rest of the agenda really focuses first on uh, a 20-minute presentation by one of the Calhoun folks. Maybe Will is going to present that, where we hear about your local data management approaches and and uh, and try to understand your specific uh, your specific uh, the tools that you use and and your approaches uh, and the things that you've tried and and some some of your questions. Um, and then after, and, and some of that has been answered here in this questionnaire that we wrote out. And then we're going to kind of turn turn things around 180 degrees and look at uh, the CZO data guidelines and essentially have a conversation um, where we try to clarify what those guidelines are and also answer any questions that you all have or any concerns that you all have. From there, uh, I think in that process, we'll come up with uh, kind of some action items for moving forward for uh, either a set of recommendations from us or a set of um, maybe you, you'll ask for our assistance on certain things to help you out, and, and we'll, we'll uh, take those as action items for the next uh, six, five or six months of this project. And then lastly, we are near the end of the current funding cycle. Um, most of our development money is wind, winding down, if not over, and we're focusing on on outreach and training and helping you all out. Um, but we are also in a conversation with NSF about future funding, or we're, we'll, we'll be beginning that conversation now that the CZO reverse site visits are, or site visits are, virtual site visits are, are um, near, nearing completion. So we're interested in your input about how the CZO data, the national CZO data um, project, what, how it can grow to meet um, future needs of yours. Any questions about anything yet? Sounds good. Who is Who should I give the presenter ball to to present uh, the slides that you have? My computer is kind of frozen right now. Um, so does Anthony have, it, have those slides? I do. Yeah, yeah, I can get them. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is Will Cook. I'm the data manager, and uh, we're just getting going with the data management. I've been focusing most of my time on helping get the Calhoun CZO built and instrumented and set up. Um, yeah. We're just now focusing on management. So uh, we're not very sophisticated yet. Uh, basically, it involves me emailing everyone and trying to wrangle some data out of them and get a basic information about on the uh, on the CZO website. Uh, currently, we have all the data uh, posted on a Duke server, but uh, we're hoping to get that moved to AIDA and uh, get device and everything to get it up to speed, but that is to come. All right. So, Will, do you want me to walk through these slides? That was a good introduction. Um, but uh, I sure. was able to download your slides. Do you want to? Do you want to talk through them, and I'll just advance as you instruct me to? Uh, sure. The first few slides are from a couple of. Uh, <clears throat> CZO researchers that want to talk about their data needs. Uh, first mm -hmm. one is Jay Austin. Is he online? 
Yes, he is. Jay, can you take it? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, um, so I guess really what we're doing is we're trying to upload our data, um, and really we're trying to go through the um, Earth Chem library, I guess, to get DOIs. And one thing we can't do is find a way to upload raw XRD data. So we were just, just put these couple slides together to kind of let you guys know what kind of data we have, and I guess we could figure out a way to make that work uh, in the Yoda format or any other format that's searchable on the uh, website. But a lot of this stuff may be irrelevant based on what you guys tell us today. Um, I guess we'll find that out. Um, there's a lot to read, so um, basically all it does is outline there's three different levels of data that we have. Most of them can be uh, made to fit the Yoda format as far as I understand it, reading the website. It's just the raw data, really, that we will not be able to uh, make comply. I don't know if this is relevant for you guys or not right now. Or, and the next slide is just a continuation. Yeah, this is definitely relevant, and we can get back to this. Um, perfect. I think there are uh, things we can do now, and there are things that we are um, that we have put into place that should enable quite a bit of this to happen in the future, but um, not in the next six months. But uh, for example, uh, ODM2 was a, one of the use cases is to handle spectral, raw spectral data. Um, so we have it in our plan. There's a big need for this um, in, the, in the geochemistry community, uh, Kirsten Leonard's group. Uh, it's one of the many use cases of why the AIDA EarthChem system needed a new database uh, design that the, the old EarthChem couldn't handle spectra, raw spectral data, which are absolutely important. So um, it's one of the many use cases we built in the ODM2. And as, as some of you might know, uh, the new EarthChem database uh, is built on ODM2. So um, a Yoda file can, ha can conceptually handle anything that's a ODM2 database, excuse me, an ODM2 data set. Uh, according to that specific definition. So this is, a, this is a possibility for the future, but not one that we'll implement. But we can talk more about that uh, next. So why don't we move on to the next bit? If I could, if I could just add a, uh, an underline, perhaps. Uh, these raw XRD data and these raw spectra data, um, I guess you, I, I just want to underline how important those data sets are because, um, <clears throat> as a product of each of the observatories, those are, those are kind of the touchstones with which other mineralogists or spectral scientists will come back into our data and kind of you know, dive deeply into what it is uh, that we're producing uh, free, of, <laughs> free of our interpretation. So the ability to upload XRD data is a good example of uh, something that we can contribute to the bigger mineralogical community. Yeah, and yeah. Then, um, Paul Schroeder, um, to add to that, you know, we have been making efforts to, you know, contact, um, you know, the System Earth Science Registration, the whole international geo sample numbering system. We've corresponded with them about templates, and we really, um, you know, they keep pointing us back to the fact that they have templates set up, but everywhere we go, we don't find any of the templates. So it's clear they're... Um, Mm -hmm. they have the templates is, I guess that's what I'm understanding, and maybe uh, that's where we need to have some discussion um, on how to proceed with that. Um, yeah, Jay wants to add to this. I guess I would ask too: Is it better for us to go to like the EarthChem database people and work with them to set up a template, or to work with you guys to set up a template for the CZO database? Um, you know, how do you, how do you, what do you guys prefer we do? Work through you guys, or work, or contact them directly? Right. Well, you're, we're getting right into the meat of the discussion um, of some of the many discussions. So, let's see. Uh, the short answer, and I think that we, I, I think, I think it'd be useful to hear from you, and then kind of hear from us, and then we'll, we'll dive into the into the really longer answer. But the short answer is that the EarthChem people are part of our team. Like we are fully integrated with EarthChem. Right, the director of AIDA, who oversees EarthChem database, the EarthChem database manager, 
uh, are all parts of this. They're, they're active members of the CISIO data team. Er, the new EarthChem database was built upon ODM2 that was designed by the CZO data team in response to the use cases that the CZOs, we knew that the CZOs would be presenting to us. And then um, that effort from ODM2, the, the conceptual design of ODM2 has, in the last year and a half, rolled back into the rebuilding of EarthChem. So, so it's a pretty monumental effort that we undertook, super ambitious. Uh, and we're all scrambling to get services in place built upon that. The AIDA team uh, wants desperately, has for years, to support spectral data, um, but I don't think they yet have a template. They are, um, would probably say, if you want to develop a template with them, you could go ahead and do it. They may also say, um, why don't you, why don't we do this through the Yoda file ODM2 approach because that would actually be a more complete template. However, the timeline for that may be a bit longer. So, it, you know, it all, it all, it all has to do with kind of balancing priorities and it's, and it's a challenge because there's so, there's so many very fast moving parts right now. Okay. I'm on this, this subject too, you know, um, I know you're going to get to it, but this whole idea of definitions, um, you know, clearly when we start talking about specific types of data, therefore that it has to be defined. And I guess at some point, uh, maybe not right this moment, but I would certainly like to get an update on the um, path towards um, how definitions are um, really accepted and generally vetted amongst the uh, the group. So anyway, uh, we can we can answer that one for you. Okay, thank you. Yep, that's a whole that's a huge effort that we put in um, into the ODM2 vocabulary system, which is more than again just it's it's uh, it's more than just a system for ODM2 databases. It's a system actually to serve all uh, a lot of the Earth surface sciences and critical zone sciences. Okay, so that's a good example from Jay. I think we have two others. Uh, and is Kathy uh, available verbally? Um, I think so. Can you hear me? Yeah, we do. Oh, great. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm working on some of the education and outreach components and uh, wasn't really sure how this fit in necessarily to the, the overall data structure, but wanted to give some examples of the kinds of things that kinds of products that are going to be coming out and um, get some thoughts on, on how best to handle this. Two examples, um, one of the things that we're working on is a set of, uh, set of educational modules, and right now we're looking at iBooks Author as a format because it allows us to embed video and access some of the data sets, and it's, it's fairly interactive um, for that. So that, that's one of the formats we're working with. Um, we're going to have a series of educational materials that may take the form of PowerPoint that, Word, PDF files, those sorts of things. Um, some of the lab activities and the classroom activities will be in the form of data sets. I'm anticipating that these would be uh, subsets of data provided by other investigators, so those would be kind of static files. Uh, ideally, what we would like to be able to do is access some real-time data, and that's a, a larger discussion, but just to throw that out there, to, to, we have to figure out how exactly we're going to do that. And then um, there will likely be some video and audio associated with that. All right. So lots of excellent stuff here. Most of it is outside of the scope of our project. However, um, a number of us are working actively on other projects that may, in the next couple years or a year or two, uh, provide some of these capabilities. I think things like uh, educational modules and, and other educational materials, my understanding is that there's quite a bit of resources for teachers to share those things. Mm -hmm. They could be cross-referenced by the criticalzone.org uh, publication system or some of the other components of that website that could, you know, just expand um, the discoverability and maybe the audience for using those. Okay. 
Great. So, so we don't. That's not something that we have to worry about trying to to go through this system with. Uh. Uh-uh. No, we're not. This is Don Nelson. Can I uh, make a comment? Or sure. Question, perhaps about. So, um, Mike and I, I, I think, uh, have similar data in some regards to, to what Kathy's talking about. Um, and we've been looking through all the documentation on the CZO website and, and have had trouble figuring out uh, or finding exactly where a lot of our data types would fit in. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a lot of, uh, and, I, and perhaps I don't know exactly what the, the uh, geospatial uh, opportunities are, but we also have a lot of uh, textual documents, so we are um, finding text, we're digitizing, uh, parcel boundaries. We are, re- you know, reporting a lot of data that comes from these historical texts. Lots of image archives, as well for photographs, um, and some census data. One of the things that uh, we came across um, there is the Interuniversity Consortium for Political and Social Research, uh, which is housed at the University of Michigan. Um, but it, it has a number, a very high number of university and other institutional uh, members. Uh, and it is really designed to archive um, social science in all its various formats, including geospatial data, um, and quantitative and qualitative data. And it does, you know, it has all of the, I guess, Characteristics that you need, so it can assign DOIs and you know have long-term archival storage and, and things. And so, what I was curious about is if that might just be the best way for us to go about archiving and organizing, managing the data, and then we could just have live links on the CZO website to those data sets. Absolutely, that use case is perfect, and we can handle that really well. So. The CZO dataset listing approach, which we're going to describe, um, is designed to point to resources um, in any format, in any location, and in any web accessible place. Um, And the ideal is to put the data eventually, sooner, sooner better than later, in an archival data center or data repository. And we have a whole page that describes kind of the recommendations for how to choose that data repository. And the very first um, criteria is to choose one that is aligned with your domain of interest. So you've already found one that probably no one on our team actually was even aware of. Maybe maybe that's not true. There are some some of us that, that know quite a bit. But, but you know, social science data sets are, are definitely outside of the realm of what um, most of us have been working in. And but if they have these you know well established approaches, metadata profiles, and they can assign DOIs, that is the perfect place for the data to reside, and um, the CZO data system can point directly to it. Uh, and I can des- we can describe how that um, is more is actually much more than a web link uh, on a web page. It's actually the the CZO data set listings get converted. Uh, into ISO 19115 metadata profiles that get ingested into a geoportal server for um, data sets with multiple components and geospatial information. And those can be federated to all other geoportals. Um, NOAA, Open Topography, lots of other people are running geoportals using that geospatial format. So it's so we would basically link link whatever you submit there into kind of this broader context. This is Emilia, if I can just add uh, something quickly that uh, um, I actually know about that data center uh, through a workshop in February that I was attending. I have a small workshop and I happened to talk quite a bit uh, with a gal, I am awful with names, so I can't remember her name, who was from that center. Um, we developed terrific reports, um, but I haven't been in touch with her since then. I would be happy to be part of initial sort of uh, uh, get to know each other conversations with them. If you and I, I'm sorry, I forget the name of the person who spoke, but if you wanted to set up a call, um, just to Nelson. get to know, uh, great, um, just to uh, learn about each other, I'd be happy to be part of that call. I can't make any promises yeah, that we're in a position. That would be great. 
That would be great, Emilio. Um, I haven't yet contacted them. We have an on-campus oh. representative, but she's more about, she, she uh, helps out more with how to search uh, those archives rather than how to do your data management plan and actually if you, if you want to pursue this, uh, and see, you can see, see me via email at some point, and I will, uh, that will be my reminder to dig out the name of this person, and I will contact her directly also to, to engage her in this. She was just a fantastic person um, that I would love to interact with. <laughs> yeah, that would be great because I think that if there were any issues about making these things compatible, um, that you would be ideal for, for that conversation. And, and, and Kathy, again, I think Kathy, if you want, I can include you the, on these emails as well. So, but yeah, so this is Don Nelson, Emilio. I will okay. uh, send you an email. Uh, Perfect. Okay. Could we straighten out? That was uh, Ilya. Emilio. No, that was Emilio. <laughs> Emilio Mayorga. Okay. Stand corrected. <laughs> um, and uh, again, my responsibility is the data in the CCO data team, the data visualization portal. So I'm not making any promises that we can integrate anything from that uh, uh, social sciences uh, data center in the near future, but uh, into the visualization portal. But I'd be happy to contribute to uh, conversations. So I'll try to be brief. This is uh, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Don. Can can we back up? This is David Zabinski. Uh, I just wanted to back up a little bit for Kathy and both Don. Uh, for Kathy, even though we said that the education outreach kind of modules, components that you have on your slide are outside the scope of CZO data, they're not really outside the scope of um, helping out with through the main website, so criticalzone.org. So there's definitely things we can do to help you in the short term, and I should also point out that the national office is has an outreach education component that will be increasing in the next year. So definitely I'll try to be in touch with you and you can work with Will and Paul. We can find ways to get some of this into the main website, um, somewhat outside of CZO data itself. Okay, great. Uh, and then I also wanted to point out to Don that, um, that Will did send me a few days ago, you know, kind of the point that social sciences are somewhat un underrepresented under the current structures and stuff for CZO data. So it's definitely on our list to think about, for example, adding some tagging to get it more clear um, what some of those data sets are. So there's definitely some short-term things we can do um, from CZO data as well to help give some increased visibility to the social science data sets. Mm -hmm. okay. That's great, thank you. Okay, let's move, along. let's move along. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, well, you just flipped to a slide that was relevant, uh, unbeknownst to me. Um, I was asking if this CZO dataset listing is also where you would or how you would cope with sequencing data, which which typically is deposited in public repositories like NCBI's GenBank or something. I mean, the, the data sets are far too large, I assume, to be hosted anywhere else. So mm -hmm. would it be... Would it be linked to via the CZO data set link? Yeah, that would be the way to do it. So there are, there are kind of a couple layers of, of response here. The first layer is that the CZO data, National CZO Data Project itself, is not a repository. That's not our charge. Our charge is to help CZOs integrate their data. We have created partnerships with uh, a couple of data repositories that in the earth sciences were already far ahead of the rest in terms of integrated, you know, value level, record level data integration. That is um, AIDA and QASI for geochemistry and hydrological data respectively. But we're, um, but uh, we had to create a system that could handle all CZO data and we knew that uh, a lot of those data sets were, were uh, outside of the scope of those two repositories. We've had conversations with the LTER uh, network information system people, and they are opening up their data system for uh, their, their archival data, data system or data center for all CZOs, uh, in addition to the knowledge network for, for uh, biology or bio, biodiversity, I can't remember which. And we'll get to that in a, in a moment. So there are any, really any, any data repository uh, we can work with 
Um, so our role is to just kind of be, help with search and integration activities that help bring all those things together. We don't store data ourselves. With respect to um, the, the biological omics uh, data sets, those are very well established. What's less established are, are, the, are where omics meets the environment. And on a separate project that most of the members of this team are funded on um, called the Big CZ Data Project. Uh, big CZ is for bio geo integration, bio integration with geo. We're explicitly working on trying to bring those omics data sets, kind of create bridges between um, these various biological, especially the microbial um, metagenomics type data sets. And we're working with people at, um, uh, at Argonne National Laboratory. To, to do that. We're actually having a workshop in three weeks on, on that. So, so that's, that's where the possibilities are uh, coming down, down, down the pipe. So if you already have data, you can kind of link it into the fold of the CZO data. If you already have data hosted somewhere else, you can bring it into the fold. Okay. In terms of full-blown data integration services, those are those are for, for these omics data sets. Those are um, down the road, but we've been thinking quite a bit about them. But that's not within our current scope. Okay. So what's the next step here? So that is that the end of the slideshow. Okay. So the next uh, step. No, 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 no. Just a second. <laughs> We'd like to. All right. Up next. Got yeah, it. All right. Uh, we're back. Yeah, um, this is um, John Mallard speaking. I just wanted to run through really quick what we got deployed um, as far as field hydrology goes. Uh, um, do you want to mm -hmm. share your slides? I've got them up here. Uh, it's okay. It's, it's just a it's a list of things that probably no one wants to read through while I'm talking. Okay. So I'll run through it verbally. Um, so currently I have about um, 45 separate data streams um, starting anywhere from uh, last February to as recently as a week ago. Um, over the next month, I expect that to increase by uh, about 33%. Um, these are variables measured as time series that are sort of standard hydrologic variables like uh, water level in a well, um, stage in a stream, electrical conductivity in a stream, soil moisture, things like that. And I expect that they'll be very easily incorporated with standardized data models. Um, each sensor obviously generates a specific raw data file um, at every download, and I'm downloading data um, about once or twice a month, um, sometimes more frequently. Um, with those raw data files up to now, I've been sort of following a pretty low-tech storage and handling um, process uh, in anticipation of um, more complex incorporation into a, a robust standardized database. What that looks like is, is basically um, at every download, I'm uh, downloading data files to a, a read-only folder on Dropbox, uh, which is kept on a, a field computer, and then backing up um, uh, that folder to a, a USB drive for redundancy in the field. Um, that folder is organized by date, so for Every day that I perform a download, I have a set of um, up to 45 data files. Um, then once I get back from the field, the computers connect to the internet, so Dropbox syncs. Um, and then the raw data files from each individual folder are copied to another folder specific to each data stream. And then those raw data files are incorporated into an overall Excel spreadsheet. So essentially what we've got is um, a whole collection of raw data files organized both by the date that they were downloaded and by the specific data stream. And then just a basic spreadsheet with all of the raw data files incorporated um, for that specific uh, location. So, you know, well 3.84 water level. Um, and so I guess my interest here is just figuring out the most streamlined ways to um, extend the current storage and handling process I've got. 
um, into this uh, cross CDO sharing. Any questions, Anthony? Sure. So, so the the first the first clarification is kind of the whole the whole approach to this integrated national CCO data um, project is that is that at the actually at the request of the first three CCO PIs that each CCO kind of do their own management approach and where everyone should use the same approach is in how they share the data so that data can be integrated. So, so every single CZO is kind of doing their own thing. That said, our CZO um, team, uh, the, the national CZO data team, has quite a bit of experience with different aspects of local data management also. And in, in several, uh, in several instances, we could provide some some suggestions and guidelines um, for that. We have specifically uh, put quite a bit of energy into uh, this observation data model two, which is um, which is uh, the basically a data model that was designed from the get go to allow to expand the data use cases to allow things like geochemical data from multiple specimens and specimen fractions and, you know, basically an entire soil pit full of uh, Ziploc bags and all the various geochemical analyses you could imagine on them to be put in the exact same data system as a streaming sensor uh, database and, um, and, and also in the same data management system where you might have things like sensors on airplanes or, um, you know, uh, or spectral data um, collected in the field, or whatever it might be. So, so that's what ODM2 does, and we are because we developed it conceptually for these large infrastructure projects. We've also we have a lot of interest in seeing how it could work also for local data management. So we we could help you get started on that. There are other solutions that have been established for a long time. Um, ODM2 is relatively new. It's now the it's now the foundation for AIDA's system. Uh, Quasi is looking at it um, for the Water Data Center. Um, it's being used by Jeff Horsborough for all of his local data management. Um, it's, uh, the Lucio CZO has adopted it, and Arizona CZO is a, is is about to adopt it. Um, but nevertheless, it it does require some data management, uh, data, database, relational database skills to, to adopt it for local. We can talk about that, but um, there are other ways to manage local hy hydrology data. Um, really, the standard approaches developed by Quasi for ODM1 are is a good place to start. Also, so you know, an individual, our idea and some of the funding we have for this big CZ project is actually to create an, uh, an basically a toolbox, the big CZ toolbox, which is something that you can download and um, for local management, uh, that's relatively easy, but that's, that's still uh, about a year away from being completed. So, so but we could, we could, you know, we could, we could help. There are, you know, there are hydro servers in the cloud that Quasi is uh, has developed and and is uh, promoting. Okay, sounds good. So, uh, Anthony, this is Dave Lubinsky again. Just it might be worth pointing out the, you know, ways to tap into the knowledge of all the other CZOs and their data managers, and uh, and the, uh, this idea you could that you could use the IMC email. Um, as a way to at least start some conversations. Thank you, Dave. Um, yeah, so there's the CZO Data Information Management Committee, which are data managers, a few investigators, some PIs, and then our team. There's a Google group for that CZO, CZO Data IMC, and we can accept quite a few other people. The intent was that it would be kind of a peer-to-peer -peer forum to, to be able to ask questions and get advice on. Uh, to date, there hasn't really been as much sharing as we'd like, and we'd like to really encourage that. Um, some of the th innovations that have happened at some of the CZOs uh, could really go a long way from helping other CZOs. 
but everyone has their own local system that's quite a that you know is is unique to that CTO. So we've got the slide. Other data sets include and a milk array. Yes, uh, Anthony, this is a milk array. I just have a Hi. quick question about modeling at the end. I, then I have to leave to to teach. Uh, okay. So we have uploaded the script, general description of of our modeling efforts, but the the main question you would like to share actually the 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 codes, the program codes of the of our models because I think we other CZOs or in general people could use it to just generate scenarios and play with uh, with different uh, hypotheses. So what is the situation about sharing? Uh, MATLAB codes, Mathematica codes, or Fortran, whatever. Uh. All right, I'm going to jump ahead um, since you're about to leave. So, well, I talked earlier about recommended data repositories. We've got all this on the Critical Zone website. It's a relatively new set of pages we developed. Um, Quasi HydroShare is a relatively new project um, trying to develop this online collaborative environment for sharing data, models, and code. So I would encourage you to, to try out HydroShare. Okay, excellent. This is the, I mean, the other approach would be to use what, what the programming community has adopted, which is GitHub, but it may not be connected enough to your community. But there's yeah. also a new um, a new EarthCube uh, project called yeah. Ontosoft, which is uh, an effort uh, led by Yolanda Gill, a computer scientist from the University of Southern California, building an archive or repository for software, and they they do set up portals for specific communities, so it could be, you know, it's somewhere between GitHub and HydroShare, I would say, uh, uh, and could be sort of customized as a CZO uh, portal to, to code if there is more than something that's relevant for hydrology. That's a, I didn't, thank you. I, I, I knew that Yolanda had gotten funded for that, but that's great to see this. There's also, yeah, we, you know, the, yeah, go ahead. We we just recently set up a portal for the um, the RCN that we have in EarthCube, the cyber infrastructure for paleobiosciences C4P. So that that URL is C4P. On. So it specifically just um, makes accessible the software relevant to that particular community. Did I get that right? No. Oh, C4P dot Oh, C4P. This is dangerous, me typing in URLs by hand. Huh? I could end up on something embarrassing. All right. Well, we'll try to. So, okay. So this is one of those portals. Um, I'll also Portal. mention that. Mm hmm. Perfect. So there are lots of, EarthCube in particular is really trying to create these resources for um, for models and code and uh, in addition to data and, you know, software, all, all sorts of resources. Another one that's, that's important to our community is the um, CSDMS, Community Surface Dynamics Modeling System. Um, they have a model repository that's been around for quite a long time. There's I'm, there's there's also one more which was something I did last week which is not quite fully off the ground they're just getting um, some programmers and directors which is the national data services. Oh, the NDS. Um, yes. Yeah. So, um, and that one that one's also looking. So it depends on also what your goal is to sharing this. You're, if you want to share the way for people to just get the code and do it, that's one thing versus there's also the purpose of being able to actually run and execute the models. Um, that's partially where quasi the HydroShare fits in and that's where the data services kind of fits in. Yeah, all right. Okay, Here's thank NDS. you. Is that it, Emil Cray? 
that's, that's, yeah, that's a good start, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Anthony, could you just return to the other data sets and, and yeah. we'll, we'll maybe conclude this part of the meeting? Sure. Uh, I, I, I wanted to get a sense to you of the wide range of data sets that we're collecting. Some, many of these are comparable to other CZOs, but I, I pushed ahead like Don and, and Mike Coglin to, to get their social science data questions to you. Um, in any event, this is what we're dealing with. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Most of this looks pretty similar to all the other CZOs. Uh, the social science stuff is uh, not all there. Are, I'm not sure there are many other CZOs, if any, that are doing a lot of social science. So that that was pretty cool to hear about. So I, IML is is uh, is kind of in the same category. Um, I, I think the Idaho Reynolds Creek has a bit of uh, land use history story that it, that it will tell mm -hmm. through time. Um, in my own personal point of view, this is, this is the future of of the critical zone science. It's not just solidly interdisciplinary in the natural science way, but it's it's pushing up against social science. In any event, let's let's move on to the, if we're happy at this point to move ahead. Uh, I, I believe. All right. I think we'll have more more of these items come up um, in the discussion. Is there are there any questions from anyone on our team, um, either from the presentation? or from um, what's written in the questionnaire down in these points below that I'm showing. All right. Let's see where that we got notes getting typed. Excellent. Okay. So I'm going to move forward and um, and actually do a brief overview of our new set, uh, our massively set, uh, expanded set of guidelines on, on how to sh submit CZO data. Um, we had one page here before and we expanded it out to 10. And essentially in, in our, uh, in the first year of our, of our time, we were focusing on you know, how to access data that's been submitted, and we, we built systems around that. But what we realized recently is that we hadn't really given enough guidance, although we'd given cyber seminars and other things. We didn't have things written, and, and data managers and PIs were confused about what our recommendations were for sharing. So we've, we've kind of elucidated these, and we've, we have described that there are uh, essentially seven sets of expectations of how CZOs should share data, and those are kind of briefly described on this submit CZO data page. And then we have two optional approaches that we are, are interested in, and willing and interested in supporting CZOs in implementing. Um, and we can give other guidance in other areas, but, but these are the two optional approaches that we uh, are, are, will, will support uh, directly. So I'm going to just flip through these. Um, how, who amongst your group has, has actually looked over these new web pages that have been out for about a month now? That's a good question. You have All right. Yeah, some of us, but probably most of us have not. Yeah, that, that's my experience with other CZOs. It's only been out for a month, so it's totally understandable. So I'm going to go through kind of a fast description, but I really urge you all, if there's confusion, to read read these. Um, the very first approach is listing data sets at criticalzone.org, which is this web, this web page uh, or this web system right here. Um, in each of these uh, nine seven expectations and two recommended or, or optional approaches, we describe why doing this is useful, what are the benefits, what are the outcomes of following this, this guideline. Um, and then we, we provide detailed instructions that hopefully will really help you move through things. And then in some cases, I don't think this is, this is one in particular, we also provide things like recommended vocabularies or recommended um, data repositories and, and some additional information with, with uh, links. We, we put quite a bit of time into this documentation. Through these consults, we've realized we need to do another round of revisions. There are some things that are still confusing, but um, 
we feel quite good about it. I should point out that that the page underneath CZO data system is outdated, and we're in the process of of uh, that's our next target to 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 do a round of revisions there. So listing data sets at criticalzone.org is the place to start. Um, it's a data set listing on criticalzone.org. Let's see here. I'm going to go. I'm going to hit this access CZO data, and there, there are essentially three approaches to finding the CZO data. One are these data set listings, which are just web pages, but they're more than just web pages because they actually populate um, the data search portal, which is this uh, geo server that I was talking about. Uh, I can't talk and click at the same time. All right, so I'm going to point us toward what your holdings are. So these d data set listings, looks like you've got a pile of them that have been loaded up already, um, are basically groupings of data, data types, and they can be made, uh, uh, you know, there's a bunch of metadata here, descriptions, keywords. Um, you can also include links if you, if you dig in the web forms to the um, NSF grant number, et cetera. And each one of these can, can handle a whole pile of files. So they're not really meant to be just a single file, but really a whole pile of files. So one could have um, a whole data set just on the historic data pits and have 15 different files that it points to. The files themselves, if you look at the bottom of my screen, I don't know if you can read that while I'm screen sharing, but doesn't, it doesn't actually point to a file. It points to some place on your server. Eventually, it could and should point to a place at a, at, a, at a data center using a DOI. So that's the intent. But any file that you have can be shared in this way um, of any sort. So those hydrological Excel files that, uh, that have been uh, developed can be shared, and, and you're, already, you're already doing this. And, and as you can see here, these things can be held private, and then um, the data sets, once they become public, um, it's just changing the link and changing things. Meanwhile, the profile uh, is, is maintained. So the, all of this information gets harvested every 24 hours and is available at the data search portal, which is, this, which is um, a powerful search interface. So we can do this fasted search where we search for, you know, Calhoun and maybe geochemistry. Oh, that was maybe the wrong one because of the way the tagging is, but uh, I was going to look for a Mossbauer. Oh, I probably can't spell that properly because of that special character that was used. Uh, so that's not going to show up, but uh, what's another keyword here? Enriched iron, right? So. Um, so this can find things really quickly, but more importantly than that, it's built on a geoportal that allows all this machine-to-machine -machine interaction. And one of the things you might have noticed is that in addition to the powerful search capabilities, there is the ability to, um, to federate with other data systems. So all the open topography LIDAR catalog is actually available through this search interface because they also use a geoportal. Lots of other organizations do too, um, and we have that capability to federate. So, so there, there are powerful capabilities by listing your data um, uh, on criticalzone.org. It's not just a web. It's just not just a web browser. Uh, it it actually um, enables this data discovery and federation over a much larger scale than might be evident from, from this. But it also provides this very nice uniform way to browse. So any file can be listed. Um, when the system was first developed, there were certain files that allowed us to do direct data integration. Those files were called CZO display files, version one. and um, um, and those display files had, had great, great capabilities because we could read them and parse them and ingest them into the Quasi Hydro Server system for direct integration. So it did not require local data managers at CZOs to use a Quasi Hydro Server. Um, and it was an easy way for them, you know, you could, you could create a display file quite, you know, in a text editor or in a spreadsheet. Uh, they were pretty easy to develop. Um, 
uh, and it allowed any CZO to basically share data using Quasi's integrated infrastructure. That had issues, and so we, um, along for a lot of other reasons, developed uh, ODM2 as a conceptual model that, that uh, as I've mentioned over and over again, is um, the foundation, the conceptual foundation for a lot of what we've what we've done. What we've done. These Yoda files are designed to be the replacement for CZO display file. They will be able to handle um, a broad variety of data sets. However, generating Yoda files is not something that is quite as easy to do as an old school CZO display file. And we need to do quite a bit more work. The, the prototypes that we released in the spring um, had a number of issues. So right now we don't have easy to, um, easy to use uh, approaches for generating these Yoda files, but it still doesn't hold you back from sharing your data using the data set listings. Once you share your data as a Yoda file, there'll be these enhanced integrated services that will be possible, but, um, and we're going to create some Excel templates um, to create Yoda files or uh, some web forms to essentially go straight into the, that data integration, maybe via EarthChem. Um, so, so this is the one area that we still need to do quite a bit of work on, um, but our, uh, the work that's still pending sh still shouldn't hold you back. The next thing that's, that's quite complete um, and very important is to share your data and manage your data using uh, established vocabularies. Controlled vocabularies are terms with definitions, and there were some questions about that earlier. There are a lot of benefits to using control vocabularies in a general way, which we describe here. We give specific instructions for how to use a vocabulary system, and one of the first instructions is to um, select the appropriate system uh, and look look first in our recommended control vocabulary um, list, which is down here. If you're using a, a quasi hydro server. Uh, or an Earth an EarthChem DB Excel template, then those are good vocabularies uh, in many cases to use. But we have put a humongous amount of effort into developing um, a set of vocabularies around ODM2. This is the ODM2 vocabulary system. It is uh, the culmination of a really extensive amount of effort for merging the best of the best vocabularies from Quasi, from AIDA, and from other sources such as NASA, um, datasite.org, uh, and other, other um, systems that have vocabularies. So there's an enormous number of vocabularies here to choose from. And I'm going to go straight to uh, the specimen type vocabulary as an example. When you click on that, you can see the lists with the names, the terms, the names, and the definitions. The term is actually basically a code, it looks like a word, but it's a code that gets you um, to a whole set of information that is even beyond what is shown here. So if I click on that term, you can see here that this URL uh, gets, gets me to not just, um, oh, that's formatting a little bit odd on my web browser just because of the expansion I did. Um, it gets me to the definition of a core, uh, and then um, this one isn't particularly filled in, but it, you know, with categories and provenance and other notes. What's Im important to, to notice here is that this whole system is built on a SCOS, um, which is, uh, allows information to be transported between machines using RDF, which is, a, which is similar to XML, so that Essentially, software can be built that automatically updates and reads this information. So all you need to know is basically this URL, and that will um, can be allowed to fetch all the information about uh, that particular term. So it's it's part of kind of the new future of linked data and and everything being available um, online for machine to machine languages. But in addition something that, that really none of the existing systems have that are both, that, that are in, in built into SCOS, 
there's also the ability to edit terms. Um, so anybody who, who log, creates a login can submit a request. Actually, you might not even need a login to submit a request um, to basically modify a definition or add information. So it serves a little bit like a wiki. If there's a whole new term that you want to add, mm, rats. Oh, here we go. There is also a button for new terms. You can download the whole vocabulary as a CSV. Um, these vocabularies are are quite huge. Uh, we have a units vocabulary, including units type, which is really impressive. Um, that we basically merge quasi units with uh, with NASA units, and they have additional information like dimensionality which can be used for writing programs to do automated unit conversions. Uh, NASA has been doing a lot of work with that ever since they crashed crashed a satellite on Mars due to um, a unit conversion problem. So, so that's vocabularies um, with definitions. Uh, the ODM2 is the most complete, but it's not completely complete. We're still wor working on some of the vocabularies, and we describe where other vocabularies might be a better choice. Um, the next thing uh, is that we have fully adopted the international geosample number approach to creating unique identifiers for all specimens and sampling features. So if you bring a bag of soil in for the lab, you, you know we all know that we've got to la label it well. But um, what the IGSN does is that it gives it a tag, an identifier that is globally unique and resolvable and, and has a whole database behind it. So you can see on these tags that there are um, barcodes, and you can use a mobile device to basically um, scan that and send you straight to a web, a web URL that has all the information associated with that specimen. In it, including the parent, the siblings. So the parent might be, um, the core, in this case, it's uh, a core. These are the, uh, the maybe the core sections, and then and then you can even have children. So the IGSN system with its hierarchies can basically allow you to um, bring all the data together for a single soil pit um, through this data system. It really has uh, amazing benefits, but it really um, starts by registering your sampling sites, such as weather stations, soil pits, stream gauges, wells, um, boreholes, et cetera. Um, sampling sites are, are, are a type of sampling feature. They're not actually the equipment, the sensor on the weather station or the pressure transducer at the stream gauge. They're the location on the earth where data is being collected. A specimen is an object that you take away from the Earth to collect data on it in the laboratory. Um, so there, this whole system is uh, uh, really starts with sampling sites. If you create these unique identifiers for your sampling sites, use that sampling site information in your workflow for all your sensors and specimens, and always point to it. It's a great way to aggregate and synthesize your data at the end of the day or when, the, you know, when it's time to do that. Um, when you bring specimens into the laboratory, if it's a spec specimen that you're going to analyze more than once, um, subsample it, share it, archive it, uh, then you need to, then it, you also can benefit from assigning an IGSN to it. And as I said, the whole hierarchy gets developed. There are, there are tons of benefits that then extend beyond the local data management. If you use IGSNs in the literature, they're not unlike DOIs. Publishing companies like Elsevier are now um, basically building services around IGSNs, just like they are around DOIs. So, so um, in, in, with Elsevier and in the near future and other pub publishers, and Kirsten isn't on the line to, oh, maybe Kirsten did join us, that's right. Um, maybe she can say something about this, but there'll be the ability to basically search the literature for all the data, all the publications that have published data um, on that IGSN or related IGSNs. Yeah, just so, to add the, the 
Pub those yeah. publishing houses that are currently actually working on it uh, is all the journals of Copernicus in Europe, the EGU. AGU is working on it, and at a meeting of publishers and data facilities last week, Nature has, has now also committed to implementing it. So this feature is in, uh, quite important for um, for integrating data, and, and again, that's the role of our project is to, is to help build tools and guide you all to uh, to use tools that that integrate data. Now, we just learned today. Uh, I just learned, and some others in our team learned that you that the Calhoun CZO has registered a number of IGSNs. So that's that's exciting. Um, <laughs> Geospatial data, right? It may not be all the way across the board, but it's just, it's a great start. So we're geospatial flying, data. We're Yay! Yay! Right. <laughs> You're one of four CZOs who have done that, by the way. By the way, this is Emilio, and just wanted to add that when I learned that you had a, a IGSN, I just learned that today. Um, I've gone ahead and ingested um, those that those IGSNs into the visualization uh, portal. So now you have some data or, or metadata, I guess, um, and there are only three, right? Uh, the other, the fourth CCO hasn't made in public yet. So it's that right, fresh off the press of the, uh, this morning or <laughs> a few hours ago. So, is so this to, can I ask a question now, or should I wait till the end of the seven items here? Yeah, you can ask a question anytime. It's supposed to be a discussion. Uh, very, very quick, uh, very quick question, uh, Anthony. Uh, the Calhoun's 60 years old. We have sample archives that we continually reanalyze. They're very active samples, even though they're collected as long ago as 1962. Um, I, you know, in my mind, we're really friendly to this IGSN, although we've never done it before and we're beginning. Um, but that's that's where I want our project to go is to to spend quite a bit of time, unfortunately, IGSNing archived samples, historic samples. Got any comments to that? Can I just ask if so all those samples are in some sort of database in a spreadsheet cataloged in any way? Some sort, yes. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, I mean, the way, you know, we, we got over the years a lot of collections from repositories such as the NSF-funded core repositories or even museums like the Smithsonian uh, registering their existing collections. So if you have a database and be it just a spreadsheet that has a latitude and a longitude and maybe the name of the location and so on, uh, it's a very easy step to get the uh, those those records registered in in the IGSN system so we can help you very easily with with that thank you Kirsten yeah and that that's a huge benefit especially if you start if you're starting to pass out those uh, specimens uh, you know subsample it and and send them out to other laboratories uh, now that you're that you're, you know, more keenly interested than ever in, in those older data, those older specimens. I, that's the way to do it. Okay, so I think and, we're on and the IGSN five. system comes with barcodes, right? So you have, yeah. it basically right. hands you a free barcoding system that can work with a smartphone, so you don't have to buy special barcode readers. Uh -huh. Okay, we're on number five, Anthony. Geospatial, geospatial data. So the the scope of, of this integrated CZO data project in the beginning was really to integrate hydrological data with geochemical data. That was the primary scope, but we were also asked to kind of do something with geospatial data. It turns out that, you know, the the geospatial data works really well, of course, with the geoserver. <laughs> that's, that's the point. Um, but doing special GWIS kind of stuff with it um, is uh, is something that can be done, but uh, but uh, hasn't been done yet, and and really is is uh, could be done in the future. But all geospatial data can be shared as a data set listing on criticalism.org, basically just like any other data file. Z 
those geospatial file formats that are common from shapefiles to KMLs to geotiffs or whatever, they, those file types uh, can be recognized and used by, by cool display software down the road. The first step is we, we're, we don't have a system that does nice geospatial display of geos, that kind of geospatial data. Uh, I'm going to point out in a moment um, what, the, what the visualization portal is for. Um, but, but if you just share those data sets via um, this uh, data set listing page, that capability is is massively enabled, or is uh, you know it, the possibilities are there for us to do that in the future quite readily. Lidar data is kind of the same thing. Um, Lidar data, the CCOs have a, a, a memorandum, memorandum of agreement with Open Topography. That's a data repository specifically designed for um, Lidar point cloud data. It's uh, I don't know how much you all know about it, but if you have if you're collecting any new LIDAR data, um, if it's NSF funded or not, um, uh, contact the people at op Open Topography and uh, or work with Tom and Ilya to, to set that up. Um, and uh, it's really great. NCOM has a, has a uh, well, I don't know what your LIDAR situation is, but, but the Open Topo people will even consider um, state LIDAR if you get the right permissions. There are all sorts of great services yeah. that, that are enabled there. So our, uh, we had a LIDAR flight last uh, summer, and it's currently on the NCOM uh, servers, but how do we go about transferring it to open top topography? Write some emails that, that CC Tom and Ilya and me um, to basically Make the connections between Open Topo and Encom. There's a there's a pretty big pipeline already. Uh, the people at Open Topo would be like, oh yeah, Encom, we'll go we'll go fetch it and make this happen. Um, or in our case, early on when we were first getting started, we actually had to mail the people at Encom a hard drive, and then and then have them mail that hard drive over to the Open Topo people. Um, I don't know if that's still the case, but um, yeah, okay. But All but right. that may, may still be the case. I don't know if there's an e a, an easier way to do that now. Email Tom, Ilya, and Anthony. Very good. Right. So open topography is housed in the same building um, as Tom and Ilya's offices. So. Uh, Very good. Yeah. I guess I might have one question. This is Zach Zachary Brickheis, and I, I do. I have been doing and continue to do a lot of geospatial work with LIDAR and, and other other LIDAR-derived or not data sets. Um, uh -huh. They're frequently huge, um, or not maybe not huge, not as large as the LIDAR, but multiple gigabytes per per file. Um, and and so I'm, I, I know a little bit about open topography and its use with LIDAR data. Um, do, we, we've uploaded one, a 1933 aerial mosaic, aerial imagery mosaic that's, that's a little over four gigabytes in size. I'm wondering what's the best way to conveniently share uh, or to house, where and how to house a lot of these large uh, geospatial documents. Um, that, way, that way folks like myself don't just hoard, hoard them on my computer to myself. It is currently posted on the Duke CCG uh, site, but we would like to capitalize and things like that. We have limited space, right? Yeah. Yeah, we've got, yeah. So um, that's a great question. And um, uh, so if it's LIDAR data, open topography is designed for to be a long-term data repository for LIDAR. Uh, so they can handle it like, you know, half a terabyte or a terabyte of data. That's their thing. Um, data sets measured in gigabytes can can be shared uh, at a number of other data repositories. Um, if you get up into the many terabyte range for something other than LIDAR, that's a conversation with uh, that one that I need with the data center. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
that's, so, that's, that's a conversation with a data center or with, with your library to see if they can host that because when you get to those images or you've done them, you've probably got them in a web map server or a web map and laying them out in a web map tile server where people can um, kind of statically host and access them with the service. Um, I think, and, and, and that's not done. The other one is to talk to uh, a major hosting thing like Esri or, you know, see if they'll put it up on there somewhere. But, yeah. but, but gigabytes of data can be handled by um, one of our, our partner repositories, which kind of takes us to the next thing, the data DOIs. So, you know, well, first of all, any files that you have on your own server, you can create a data set listing for and just point to them, right? So you create this data set li listing, which is essentially develops a metadata profile. It goes into a geo portal, and people can link to, to wherever you have these files located, and they can be discovered. We're not we're we're currently not funded to build any fancy display system for that, like like David was just describing. Um, but at least that data data is accessible and and discoverable by people, and you're kind of advertising that you have this data and you're willing to share it. But um, in terms of long term archiving of the data, there are data centers that we work with, but we work but we also are open to working with any data center. The intent is that with these data set listings, you know, right now you can point anywhere and almost everybody starts with pointing at their own server. But the intent is to move the data off of your own server, especially after it's been QA, QC'd, um, put it at a data center and get a DOI for it so that it can be um, citable, so that it can be, um, and, and so it can have a persistent identifier that gets resolved as the data centers evolve and, and things change. That's the purpose of a DOI. It's a persistent digital object identifier. So that's the intent, that you would either replace or add links um, on your data set listing page and point directly at the DOI. That's all described here, why this is useful and important. Um, Data set citations are becoming increasingly valuable, and Kirsten was just describing that um, you know all the publishers they don't want supplementary tables in their in their papers anymore, even if it's relatively small. They want you to put the data the supplementary data table in a in a data repository, give you a DOI, and then the data repository maintains that. Um, you point to the DOI. It creates persistent reproducible data but also um, gives you actually the capability for bibliometrics like citations, how many people have cit cited your data set, et cetera. I don't know if you want to add anything else to the benefits, Kirsten, of moving your data to a data repository. Um, no, I think you've, uh, you've done a good job in summarizing that. Um, yeah, I can basically just confirm that uh, you know, the, the journals are, are all moving to uh, making sure, I mean, one additional benefit maybe that um, you, you not include is that everybody sees that at a data facility, uh, the, the data quality control is more rigorous. The review process has usually not taken care very well of the data. It's focused on the scientific content uh, of the paper, but not necessarily on you know how complete the metadata for a specific data set is, if it complies with any uh, community standards and so on. And that's really the job of the data facility, and that ensures reusability of the data. Yeah. So this circling back to the question about fo aerial photo images. So the very first instruction here is determine what is the appropriate data center for your data set. And um, CZO data project is not a data center, right? So there's a list below that we recommend, but really the very the the primary criteria is select um, a data repository based on the scientific discipline and data type. So we have some recommendations, which I'm going to go through below. Um, there may be a data repository for aerial photographs. And if there are, if there is, 
that's the data repository to use because they'll have the best metadata, they'll have the best services built around that type of data. If there aren't, then, then there are some other possibilities. So the data centers that we recommend uh, is first the Inter Inter Interdisciplinary Earth Data Alliance, AIDA Earth Chem Library that Kirsten Leonard's the director of. <clears throat> it's been around for a long time. It's been issuing DOIs primary for um, solid earth, uh, geochemistry, and mineralogy data, but it's now expanding into other data types. Um, and just so, let me add, actually, the second part of, of IEDA is, is marine geophysics and, and uh, a lot of seismic data and, and so on that sit in the marine geoscience data system. And there is uh, a component of that that actually deals with, with images and photos and data products of, geo of seismic surveys and so on. Uh, so, you know, if there is a need, uh, there is really no other repository, there would be ways to accommodate that here in in the sort of repository infrastructure. But that would be something to discuss further. Mm -hmm. the, next, the next data repository that we have, will have a high level of integration with is um, Quasi HydroShare. Uh, it's rel relatively new. I mentioned it earlier that it's this collaborative environment for both sharing hydro water related data, but also models and code. And these resources that they're calling these these things um, uh, could include things like aerial photography. They're they're trying to build quite a bit of services around these these resources. Um, one of the services that they they will build, and that's why we're where they're one of our highly recommended repositories is uh, services around Yoda files and and also um, ODM2 data sets exported as SQLite documents, which actually we don't really mention here, but that's another use case. So they could handle, I'm sure that they could handle aerial photographs. They have something like 50 terabytes of storage. Um, so gigabytes is something they can handle, terabytes is not. The Quasi Water Data Center is also a, a recommended data repository, but they primarily deal with time series that are continually being updated. So it's a slightly different um, kind of approach to doing DOIs, but they're beginning to experiment with assigning DOIs to web service endpoints, and we can talk a little bit more about what that means. There are other repositories, which I mentioned kind of without showing the slide, specifically for biological data. The LTR network system issues DOIs to biological data, kind of ecological data sets. Um, and the Knowledge Network for Biocomplexity also does. The LTR network, by the way, has opened its doors to CZOs. So there may be many others. We already talked about the social science data repository. Any of these that are connected to your the domain of interest um, that issues a DOI is totally appropriate. And what you do is basically connect the two by cutting and pasting, right? Because these, these web forms for loading up these data sets have a bunch of, um, uh, you know, fields that are not that different than the one on the CZO data set listing page. So you cut and paste back and forth, and then you create the link that um, basically links to the DOI, which is where which is the, considered the ultimate um, uh, resource for our, our archive for that data. Let me just, sorry, um, just adding one perspective again from um, this meeting uh, that I just had the, uh, in, in the UK, a meeting of publishers and data facilities. Um, the publishers are also um, pushing for um, a certain certification of data facilities that they accept as places where the data goes. And so that should be something to be taken into account. So several of the facilities that um, uh, that were, were mentioned will have this certification. It's either the word data system certification or data seal of approval. Others may not. So uh, if if this is if the data sets. Um, are submitted in conjunction with with 
publications, uh, then it is a good idea to check at the journals which data facilities they um, they approve as as acceptable for their particular journal, which differs in between journals at the moment still. I think that will pretty soon change, but uh, it is relevant for you to know if you, um, if you deposit your data in conjunction with the publication. Thank you, Kirsten. Can, can I, I have a quick question for Kirsten. Uh, a few minutes ago, did you, did you indicate that EarthCAM and AIDA was uh, expanding into geophysics data sets? No, it's not expanding. It always had them. So okay. the, the history of AIDA is that okay. uh, several existing systems were merged into AIDA. And right. that was, on the one hand, the marine geoscience data system, which holds a lot of the um, marine seismic data acquired on the ships. Uh, a lot of uh, they have an, the academic seismic portal that they operating and and other systems, and on the other hand, it was EarthCAM and and CSAR for for the sample registry. Those were merged in 2009 uh, and became a cooperative agreement with the National Science Foundation. So the the, the geophysical data have always been part of AIDA. Okay, thank you. I guess the question is, um, the marine geophysical data use cases are likely to be different than the um, Earth surface geophysical use cases, not, and and not, that, yeah. Yeah, not not entirely because actually the marine geoscience data system became the um, the data management system for geoprisms and margins, originally margins, now for geoprisms, which actually has a lot of land-based data now. So they have been adjusting this to land-based campaigns of, of geophysical data acquisition. Uh, they clearly don't take any data that would, uh, that would fit into IRIS data management center. I see. Okay. So there's, a lot, there's definitely potential to use um, the AIDA geophysical capabilities for CZOs uh, down the road with a little bit of thought. Down, down the road, absolutely, and we could potentially just, you know, set up a, a demo, a webinar, just to, to, to see what, what is there at the moment, you know, and if that can easily be, a, you know, yeah, used to, to accommodate that data because I know that has been a struggle, I think, for the CZOs to find places for uh, for any geophysical data. Mm -hmm. Okay, very Perfect. good. So now we're going into some of the optional stuff. Um, so I've described ODM2 and talked about it a lot, and I think there's some confusing language about what ODM2 is and what it isn't. Um, so let me see if I can do all right. And I, sometimes my colleagues uh, suggest that it, it, it's confusing in the way that I explain things. So let me let me let me start by saying that ODM two is um, is an information model that that describes how information is. Uh, should be constructed in the way it's related to each other and um, and in the hierarchies of information, what is required and what is optional for in, for information in, in order to uh, manage and organize and integrate data. Um, it is it is a profile of a very broad information model called the Open Geospatial Consortium's Observations and Measurements Standard. This is a, you know, international standards organization approved um, uh, conceptual, like full-blown conceptual model of how information should be described. ODM2 is way more specific than that. Um, it's still an information model that then can be implemented in lots of different ways. And one of the most important ways in which ODM2 is implemented is in a relational database. ODM2 can also be implemented as, uh, uh, as object-oriented software and, Im and information flows in object-oriented software. So um, the, uh, the concepts of ODM2 can also be implemented in vocabularies or in um, 
data document archival data documents like what we're trying to do with Yoda files. So it's this kind of big beast. Um, ODM2, the ODM2 relational database implementation and some of its software uh, has been uh, used as the foundation for the new EarthChem DB at AIDA, and um, uh, components of it are being used in HydroShare or will be uh, supported in HydroShare, um, and the Quasi Water Data Center is considering it now that they've you know, they, they just got funding to uh, about two years ago, a little less than two years ago, to move Quasi HIS into the cloud, and it took them about two years just to make that transition. Um, now they they realize that that system needs to uh, have new capabilities, so they're looking at ODM2 for that. So ODM2 itself can also be used for local data management of CZOs. As I mentioned at the very beginning of this conversation, the whole concept of, of how our project would work with CZOs would be that CZOs would do data management locally the way they want to do, do their data management, and our role would be to help CZOs share their data in ways that enables um, uh, data integration between CZOs. So we put all this effort into building our own data integration systems around ODM2, that same system could be used for local data management, and it seems like your CZO has maybe been looking at this as a possibility. So we, um, primarily Jeff Horsborough's team, uh, but also others, could are, are, would be very interested in supporting you in, 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 in using ODM2 locally. Um, let me show you what is what is there. So those are some of the benefits and outcomes, and it kind of describes what ODM2 is and what it isn't. And then here are some instructions on how you might use ODM2 uh, locally. ODM2, all the code behind ODM2 is is on GitHub, which is a code sharing um, uh, and and version control system that has become kind of the, the primary one that's used by the open source uh, coding community, but it goes beyond that. Under GitHub or ODM2.org, it brings you to this organization for ODM2. And in here, there are a number of repositories. Underneath the ODM2, ODM2 repository, this is where most of the information is about the information model itself, and include, that includes um, SQL scripts for generating a blank ODM2 database in any, in, on any platform, really, um, that you might use. So there's a lot of documentation on how ODM2 could be used as a local database, um, including entity relationship diagrams, et cetera. So the reason why we are interested in su supporting local OD, uh, ODM2, uh, local uh, CZOs to use ODM2 for local data management is because we're building a whole software ecosystem for our own uses uh, around uh, a, a relational database that uses ODM2. The foundation of that is the ODM2 Python API, which basically, um, for those of you with programming backgrounds, it, it translates the relational oriented database to an object-oriented co uh, coding framework in Python. And this layer then enables us to build the software around the ODM2 relational database. And I think one of the most more interesting and more developed software that's been around for a while, first uh, as an ODM1 um, toolbox, is this uh, graphical user interface, this graphical, you know, point-and-click program that anybody could really use that allows one to do time series management, things like drift correction and offset corrections and uh, a bunch of QA, QC work on time series, but it all sits on top of an ODM2 database. So, you know, the, this is actually getting reasonably mature, this ODM tools Python. So there, so these various software approaches are at various levels of maturity. The database itself is quite mature. The API is quite mature. 
And because of that, we've there's now ODM Tools Python that's quite mature. Um, the streaming data loader to have sent wireless streaming sensor data like automatically fill out your database, that's getting mature. And the things that we're actively working on now are things like um, implementing Water One Flow web services to then take the data that's coming into your database and expose it to the Quasi HIS system um, out of your database. So that's on its way. Um, the Yoda file specification that we were that we're working on, um, we kind of realized that the approach we had taken to use Excel Excel templates to help people generate Yoda files was uh, we were putting too much into the macros, and the macros were very buggy. They were Visual Basic macros um, in in the Yoda file in the Excel um, template itself. So we decided to take a step back and do um, a lot of the validation outside. So basically, the idea is that we'll fill out, fill out an Excel spreadsheet and then um, submit that Excel spreadsheet to a website or basically run it through a, uh, um, our Yoda tools package, which would do things like validate it for its uh, um, the, for the format, validate it against the control vocabulary system, and then do things like load it into an ODM2 database. We could also generate Yoda files from an ODM2 database. So this is kind of where we've been putting our efforts for um, uh, quite a few months, and that's one of the reasons why the Excel template effort has been put on hold, because we want to develop these Python tools around Yoda files. So there's a bunch of things going on. What we have tried to do on this web page here at criticalism.org, down below under instructions, is kind of describe where each of these things sit and, and what um, they're capable of doing and, and where we're at in that process. So some of these things are still uh, works in progress. In fact, many of them really are. So, so this, this is an option. I'll say that uh, Lucio Cizio has already implemented ODM2, and they've developed. They've actually developed this great web-based um, ODM2 management system from a web browser. It's pretty cool to load data up into ODM2, and Miguel Leon is kind of ready to share that. So, um, so anyways, that's, those are all possibilities. If you want to hear more about that, we will. We will certain we will definitely be having a, a webinar in the coming months in the coming month or two about how to use uh, how you might use ODM2 locally. There are there are a lot of CZO data managers who are interested in that, but not all of them. Okay, uh, a quick question, uh, Anthony. This this first one on one is it, were we uh, three to five p.m. Yep, so we need yeah. to wrap up. So we need to look ahead here. Um, had some feedback and yeah, maybe some future working points. We definitely do. The last tab here is about streaming data, if you want live web services. The sh short point here is that there are lots of different approaches, um, and we're willing to work with you on those, and they don't involve necessarily using ODM2 or a quasi hydro server. There are lots of approaches if that is of interest to you. Yeah. So back to our notes. So it looks like we've, some of the members of our team uh, have been writing in ideas uh, about how to move forward. Um, and any of you who are uh, editing this document can add, add to this kind of list of next steps for how we can move forward um, in the coming months. Okay. So we heard how you know X, raw XRD files could be listed on criticalzone.org as data set listings. Eventually, uh, we hope to manage them much more elegantly with uh, a Yoda file specification, but that's down the road. Um, Sarah just wrote in, see more notes in the first overview above. So 
I guess there's quite a few notes in this document. Uh, the intent of this document was just this, so that lots of people could write notes as they're listening and thinking, and that we could refer to it. One of the things that I'm hoping to do, although I, I've had a hard time catching up as we've been having so many of these um, uh, consults, is that I, I kind of want to write a summary, kind of review each of these after, after each of these calls and write a summary and send it out to everybody of kind of the next steps. Um, so we talked about, uh, you know, trying to use use that social science archive that you described, and Emilio is very interested in having that conversation. Um, work having your education team work with Dave Lubinsky for outreach materials. We talked about how to share genetic and genomic data um, by. Oh, it looks like a bunch of stuff notes got pasted in there. Um, by uh, basically starting by creating a data set listing and, and making link linkages there. We talked about using IGSNs uh, for sites and specimens, both historical and new ones. We talked about getting your NCOM data uh, uh, sense to open topography and that Tom and Ilya could help you with that. Was there anything else? So we, we're planning a, a, a winter leaf off flight. So um, I haven't talked to the people at NCOM as to the uh, transfer of those data, but we'll make it more seamless than our first flight. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any suggestions? This is nice. These, uh, Recommendations popped up from all of you using computers. <laughs> yeah. That's the benefit of Google Docs. You bet. I really appreciate it because I can't talk and write notes at the same time. Totally. So, so I don't know, this is Sharon Billings. I don't know if you want me to respond to the uh, letter E there. Mm -hmm. um, it's, the, it's Lydia Zeglin. She's at Kansas State. Oh, I see. So she's not at KU, and I don't know if she's going to Argonne, but I know that I am. Oh, so. well, <laughs> excellent. Then we don't need to discuss anything further then if you're coming. That's okay. terrific. At some Before point offline, you. I'd like to talk with you, Anthony, about that meeting. Not now, obviously. All right. Sounds good. So those last two points that we kind of went over kind of quickly, well, maybe laboriously in the case of ODM2 and quickly in the case of streaming data. Is that something that that you're interested in having us pursue with you, or do you want to think about it more, either of those, ODM2 or streaming data? So anybody want to respond to that? Uh, I can take the second one a, a little bit. Uh, I've got a proposal with Verizon because their cell coverage sucks. Um, so it, we, we've got to think that through, but I would... I would love to have some streaming data uh, capabilities, uh, in particular for our, for three of our PhD students. Mm -hmm. So to be experts. clear, what we're interested in helping you with is taking is taking the data, you know, getting the data over the wireless network yeah. and into your building. That's not yeah. what we're going to help you with. <laughs> yeah. But once it gets into your building, getting right. it like into, as a quasi web service so that it can be discoverable and available via all the clients to Quasi. Uh, that's what we would help you with. You bet. All right. All righty. So we have a couple, just a couple minutes here. Uh, if, uh, if, if you all have some ideas or thoughts about the future, you know, what, what next? Uh, where would you like to see the National CZO Data Project go. Yeah, got to. In most, mm hmm Got a thought, uh, Will, uh, where we are in relation to Anthony's moving target. <laughs> well, it's going in a good direction. The new information on the website is excellent and very helpful and will help us get us up and going 
a lot faster. So, yeah, so we're we're going to have a series of webinars and um, to kind of dive into some of those things. We've you're the the um, the actual the eighth CZO that we've talked to, uh, and actually the last one that's scheduled. So right now we're going to try to synthesize all this information that we've got, set up some webinars to kind of give additional information for those who are interested or about each of those topics, um, maybe some walkthroughs, et cetera, and, um, and then probably have a series of, of workshops in the early winter to help us, you know, finalize things like the Yoda specimen, specimen file template once we have a, a decent working draft there. Um, we learned our lesson to not release something that's really super beta. Um, that generated, unfortunately, some frustration. Uh, hey, Anthony, this is mm -hmm. Paul. Um, I guess I'd like to get a little bit of input before we close here, um, you know, asking what we could use. I think, you know, the big push um, is for cross-CCO activities, and I think the more you guys could do um, – you know, to generate common templates, common ways to share data, um, you know, and facilitate that, um, not so much within the CZO, but across CZOs, that would be one perspective I would like to see promoted a little bit more than, than what I've seen to date. Um, and also maybe just a real quick comment uh, from you, perhaps, um, in terms of global, um, what other, you know, there is also a push and activities going on about international CZOs. Um, you know, I guess, is there any efforts in that direction as well? So if you could just tell us what's going on there, that'd be great. Sure. So um, the international CZO question is a good one. Uh, a lot of our team is very much tuned into what's happening internationally. We have not had any specific conversations with data managers from international CZOs. However, almost everything that we're doing has a very much of an international focus. The, the San Diego team has been instrumental in developing WaterML2, which was an, is an international um, time series data standard. Kirsten's team at AIDA has been at, very actively involved with uh, you know, the International Geosample Number, which has got an international governing body that's actually established in Germany. Um, we developed ODM2 as a, as a specification uh, uh, or more specific profile of OGC's observations and measurement standard, which is an international thing. We've given presentations at that, um, at those technical meetings, which are very internationally focused. So we've been thinking quite internationally, but um, but the international network is still fuzzy enough that we haven't really dove into conversations with specific data managers from any of the other programs. I'm not aware that there's, there's a high-level data discussion yet going on with the international network, but we also, but we're, but we're quite uh, aware that that will probably be coming down the pipe. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I don't know if you, other people got an email from Tim White, and uh, there's going to be some meetings at the AGU specifically yeah. targeted towards that. So, again, you know, um, maybe it'll be an opportunity for us to make have some face time for the people attending AGU to, uh, you know, maybe follow up on some of these these things. Is, it, is there any, um, and I apologize for my ignorance, but is there any... Uh, Organized activities related to data management that's going on at AGU. Kirsten's team always has quite a few workshops. Yeah, I mean we we have um, a Sunday afternoon uh, is going to be a, a sort of not a formal meeting, town hall type meeting about samples and the IGSN. It follows the uh, the general assembly of the IGSN organization that happens that afternoon. Um, we don't have a data publication workshop this year. Maybe we should still set that, but um, from our side, otherwise there is uh, an, 
I don't know if any one of you is using GeoMap app as a visualization tool. There's, there's going to be a, a lunch, a power user lunch for GeoMap app. That's this time the only things. Otherwise, I can just encourage you to attend EarthCube meetings. So regarding, Paul, your first suggestion to do more to encourage cross-CZO data sharing, um, that one's a tough one to respond to because we've been busting our asses to do as much as we can. Uh, the amount of work behind a vocabulary system for CZOs was kind of extraordinary. Um, same thing for some of these other things. So we're doing our best. It, uh, as, as this summer activities unfolded, all the workshops, uh, Anthony, the savvy supported workshops, uh, uh -huh. a, a number of them um, um, identified some, some, some papers that are just erupting. There's no other word than erupting out of those conversations, and they're all they're all cross CZO kinds of uh, new activities. Uh, a lot of excitement, and it, it just from the sidelines, it appeared to me that that you know, in the best of all possible worlds, that might have been a way to that might be a way because they're they're continuing uh, for several years. But that might be a way that you you in a future iteration uh, facilitate uh, some better data management across the sites. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. Those Right, so those those workshops came together pretty quickly, and um, yeah. we actually, when we found out about them, we talked quite a bit about sending representatives to those to each of those workshops. And the truth is that we did send representatives to several of them, but not okay, okay, but not um, all of them, and probably not with enough of a high profile. And one of the reasons was is that uh, we don't yet have these kind of Excel-based templates that produce Yoda files that we could hand to a graduate student. Um, we are still have quite a bit of work to do there. And um, and so it's hard to jump right in and say, hey, everybody, you know, use this and all your problems will be solved. We think that we're well on that path. But, um, you know, what we've done in, uh, since March of 2013 has been pretty substantial. Uh, but that's a pretty short amount of time to b develop a whole new ecosystem about around data integration. So not quite there yet. Okay, so um, where do we go at so, the end yeah, of this meeting here? Uh, we are definitely at the end of this meeting, yeah. So we'll, we're going to continue this conversation about future needs and and I think the idea of having um, CZO data represented in one way or another with some, some uh, hands-on support at all cross CZO workshops where data integration is happening is an excellent idea and, and something that I wish uh, we could have been ready and nimble enough to, to participate in with the activities that happened in this last year. Yeah, so the Savvy uh, grant continues for two more summers, it's my understanding. Uh, back yeah. to the Calhoun, it, it seems like um, uh, the, the summary cut across our project of the various people and projects that are going to be pushing their data uh, ahead. And um, I'll, I'll reflect a little bit with Will and uh, fill, fill that out a bit um, and uh, pass that to you, Anthony. Okay. For comments and so forth. Right. So when you mean fill it out, you mean you're talking about this Google Doc, or are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, right here. You 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 guys put up the I. It, it's just above where we can see it. You have you have A through I. Uh, kind of a summary yeah. of our meeting. What I meant to say is I could fill that out a little bit because this is a Perfect. this is a sample of a of, yeah. of our project. Um, and then as the PI here, Will and I will fill that out, so to speak. Include some other ideas and and efforts that we're making that need need uh, discussion um, and then you can respond to that helping us that out. sounds good yeah that sounds excellent all right okay. 
recommendations. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, Thanks Anthony, for all uh, attending a, a marathon. Say that again. Good luck to you and your team. You bet. All right. Thank you. All right. Yep. Thanks for all the help. All right. Thank you.